Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. The program is coming to you live from Beijing. Let's begin today's show with the latest on the viral epidemic in China. The number of confirmed cases nationwide has risen to 59,000, and the number of suspected cases stands at about 13,000. The death toll has jumped by over 200 over the past day to more than 1,300. Well, more than 6,000 people have recovered. The surge in confirmed cases is mainly due to a change in the criteria used to diagnose patients. Before, test kits were the only method used in confirming cases, but now clinically diagnosed cases are also included in the total. As of yesterday, Hubei province has confirmed more than 13,000 cases through clinical diagnosis. We have confirmed and suspected cases for the novel coronavirus pneumonia. The nucleic acid tests have been used to confirm cases. But we have had a large number of suspected cases which suited clinical diagnosis. The criteria include epidemiological history, symptoms, as well as CT scans. In fact, for pneumonia cases, clinical diagnosis is most commonly used because only 20 to 30 percent of normal pneumonia cases have their etiology, which means most of the patients rely on clinical diagnosis. We felt that we should add clinical diagnosis as a criterion to help us improve the treatment and management of patients, including suspected cases. more of the latest situation of the coronavirus outbreak here in China, we are joined by a real person in the know. We are having in New York, David Ho, director and of the Aaron Diamond AIDS Research Center and also professor of medicine from Columbia University. Now he has made many innovative state-of-the-art scientific contribution to the understanding and technical treatment of HIV infection. His laboratory has also been focusing on the development of vaccines against HIV-1, both in the laboratory and also in the clinic for nearly 20 years. He is certainly a big name uh, in the circle. I'm so glad to be joined by you, uh, Professor Holt. Thank you for taking your time. I know particularly these days, Professor, you have very busy schedule. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome, Ms. Tan. Uh, it's my pleasure. Professor, let's jump directly to the first question. 15,000 cases have been confirmed during one day. That is due to the methods of diagnosis. Now, it's a combination of so-called test kit and also clinical uh, diagnose, mainly using CTs. Tell me more about the latest method. Well, I think in addressing an epidemic like this one, it is appropriate to expand the definition and adapt to the situation as the outbreak evolves. So using nucleic acid testing and now uh, La other laboratory testing such as uh, scans and clinical conditions uh, is in general helpful in managing the outbreak. Of course, this should not be misinterpreted as a surge uh, in the number of new infections. Mm. Uh, and it's important that that point be made clear. But Professor Ho, I know you were very active also during the process to deal with the outbreak of SARS. At that time, test kit was also the key word. So help us to compare what's going on now at this stage in terms of testing and the big challenge of testing to then when you guys had the solution. Well, I think, of course, there's uh, many similarities between SARS and the current outbreak. Uh, but in terms of the test kit, I, I think the difference uh, is like night and day. Uh, 17, 18 years ago when SARS broke out, 
uh, the tools were uh, rather nascent uh, and not readily available and therefore confirming an absolute diagnosis was very difficult and and the condition uh, was diagnosed largely uh, on clinical grounds although tests were indeed developed but they came uh, late in the course of the epidemic. This time I think the the virus was identified very quickly and with that information uh, test kits specific for this coronavirus was built very very fast and and then widely applied uh, and uh, generally applied very well. So the diagnostic uh, differences are, are huge and uh, it's, it's a great deal of improvement compared to uh, the past. Of course there's still a lot more work to be done and, mm -hmm. and the tests could be refined and, and made easier and cheaper uh, and linked to clinical information. Nucleic acid, that was the kinds of test that was used earlier, the test kit, as we uh, use the word phrase test kit. Uh, but now it's scans as well and other diagnosis through clinical uh, period. But uh, Professor Ho, you know, you think about the scan. If you have the patients whose lungs already shown the huge problem in the scan, that means that patient is already at a very developed stage of the disease and the lung has been attacked for a long time. So from the earlier test kit to now also include the scan, is it really going to solve the problem? Is there a really better way to do it? I, I think the, the health authorities are just trying to be inclusive. Uh, obviously CT with lots of uh, disease in the lung is is not a common occurrence is seen only in the most severe cases but in those severe cases the virus may have disappeared from from the mouth or the pharynx and therefore when you try to make a diagnosis with nucleic acid tests it may be negative yet the the patient may indeed have the new uh, viral infection so it's just trying to be more inclusive I think the clinical diagnosis uh, without the CT scan actually would, would capture uh, many more such patients. What would you term as clinical diagnosis? What would be included in the so-called benchmarks of this diagnosis? I think it would be largely fever, cough, uh, muscle aches, uh, in the absence of a clear explanation like influenza virus or other viruses and particularly uh, when there is contact uh, with uh, patients with known coronavirus infection. Mm. Now, Professor Ho, we understand this is probably already the period that the mutation is going very fast. Uh, some media report even suggests, now I'm not sure whether that is accurate or not, the fourth generation, one, two, three, fourth generation of the virus is already existing uh, in some patients as they were seeking treatment. So what kinds of situation complicated are we facing right here? Well, uh, this new coronavirus is an RNA virus. And when such viruses tries, uh, try to copy its genome, uh, there's, uh, there are going to be mistakes made. And that's characteristic of our, our RNA viruses. And so it is expected that as the virus grows in different patients, uh, there will be an evolution of its nucleic acid sequences. And so changes are expected. The real central question uh, would be whether those changes are resulting in the behavior of the virus or the aggressiveness of the virus. And so far, uh, there are no indication that that is the case. Of course, this is something that we all need to track very carefully because if the virus typically would like to better and better adapt to uh, replication or growth in humans, mm. and uh, it has the potential to become more aggressive, but I, I think there's certainly no evidence of that at this point. Earlier, it was respiratory that people have been talking about. Now, according to research done by Mr. Zhong Nanshan and his team, it is also found in human waste. Earlier, there was also media reports suggesting about the 
is in the blood cell as well. So it seems that pictures, once again, Professor Ho, is getting more complicated. Now, of course, all the things I mentioned earlier are still in the research period. It is not yet 100% confirmed as to how it's being transmitted, but still, it seems that it's much more complicated than earlier. Yes, uh, but if we even if we look back at some of the early clinical reports that came out of Wuhan and and China CDC, uh, those reports actually describe uh, the presence of of the virus by various detection methods in the in the throat, in the mouth, and uh, some in the blood, and in a few cases where there was diarrhea, the virus was also detected there. So. Uh, this is not too different from what we had seen previously with SARS. Mm. So some of that is expected. But of course, in the midst of an outbreak like this, uh, many of these things would take time to sort out. And I'm pretty sure many clinicians and researchers in China are trying to understand all of that more fully at this point. Let's understand a little bit better about the treatment and also even the vaccines. Uh, Professor Ho, you are an expert in that regard. There have been uh, earlier reports suggesting one case out of Thailand, which has been successfully treated as a result of a combination of flu drug and HIV drug. Now, you are the one, you are the champion of the so-called cocktail treatment, which is combining different kinds of drugs together. Do you think, sir, with your decades of experience, this will be the solution? Uh, I think time will tell, but in general, for acute viral infections, one may not need cocktail or combination therapy. It is in chronic infection that would go on for years and years, like HIV, like hepatitis C, like hepatitis B, uh, one would need to think about more about combination therapy. With regard to the report from Thailand, we should just consider that an anecdote. 98% of the patients recovered. Uh, so uh, whether that patient recovered from the therapy or from his uh, immune responses, mm -hmm. we cannot tell. Uh, we do know that the flu drug does not have activity against this new coronavirus, and the HIV drug has very weak activity against uh, coronaviruses. So uh, I would consider that a non-helpful anecdote. Professor Ho, you know this very well. At a healthcare crisis, uh, there are different kinds of solutions people are, are struggling with. Some are for the good purpose. Others are for the bad reason or commercial reasons only. So, Professor Ho, at a time when people are desperate for solutions, and we need to provide them as fast as possible, we don't want to miss any opportunity. But on the other hand, some of those things could lead us to a dead end. So, what is the best way to look at different options, uh, Professor Ho, with efficiency? Yes, I think uh, rumors could hamper uh, the, the control of this epidemic if, if, uh, if they're not uh, truth. And, and I think there's certainly a lot of speculation out there. I think we need to take them uh, with caution. There's a lot of talk about existing drugs that could be applied to this infection. Yes, we need to look at all the available drugs that are already in the clinic or already approved and, and see if any of them have uh, activity uh, against this virus. That should be done. And as reported, there may be a few drugs with very weak activity. And in the absence of any solution right now, uh, therapeutic solution, uh, they could be tested. But they should be tested in a way that would uh, provide informative information. Um, and so uh, that should be done. But at the same time, the, there should be a systematic effort to look for uh, drugs or chemicals that have already been tested but not yet licensed. Uh, and th some of those may have even better activity. And that's what many uh, research entities are doing right now to see if we could uh, chase down 
uh, some drugs that are pretty far along in development and if, if active could be rapidly applied to uh, help control this situation. In that regard, I really have to ask you about this, Professor Ho. I mean, you think about the coronavirus. This is nothing new. 17 years ago, the SARS outbreak uh, really shocked the world. And then we also have the MERS not many years ago. Uh, and now another one, mm -hmm. this is called the COVID-19. Uh, so it seems that one after another, haven't we really learned anything? How much energy and effort and funding and support we have been putting into the research against the coronavirus outbreak? I think, as you said, we now have had three major outbreaks due to coronaviruses in the last two decades surely it will come again. And, and so we need, as, as a world, we need to be well prepared for the next one. The next one may not be identical to the current uh, virus or to the previous SARS virus or MERS virus. But we do know that this family of viruses uh, resides in many animal species. And as human-animal contact uh, becomes more common, um, that's going to uh, result in other transmissions that could result in an epidemic. And so the world needs to be prepared, and that's why we not only need to find a, a therapeutic or a, a prophylactic solution against COVID-19, mm -hmm. but we also need to uh, think of strategies that would more broadly get, protect against this family of viruses. But one could argue from 17 years ago, people have already put in a lot of effort into doing the research. How come at this moment we still do not have anything? Well, you could argue science does not develop as just you wish to be. But still, uh, are there efforts being wasted during the process, thinking about what we had then, a crisis, and people jump on it, and then after that, people forget about it? How much of that is being wasted during this process, Professor Hope? Be frank with me. Well, I, I think as someone who worked on SARS uh, 17, 18 years ago, uh, it is very frustrating to work on drugs and work on vaccine and carry to a point where things are already tested in the laboratory and some tested in animals. But once the epidemic was controlled in, by the summer of 2003, um, there was no political will there's no governmental commitment to carry on because the epidemic is gone. And, and so those potential product lay waste uh, without support to further advance them. I think the solution in retrospect should have been to advance a drug, a vaccine to the point where they are tested in human beings uh, and, and for safety and for certain properties of the drug or vaccine, and then wait for the next epidemic. If we had done that, some of those uh, weapons in our arsenal could be applied to the current epidemic at, at least, because SARS virus and this COVID-19 uh, have a great deal of similarities. And there's a potential those therapeutics would uh, cross over to have better activity against the current virus. I have two other questions for you. Of course, they are all very complicated questions, but some brief answer from you. Uh, Professor Ho, you are a champion of scientific collaboration uh, between China and the United States. Now, with this coronavirus outbreak this year, are we going to see a new stage of cooperation in this regard, despite of the political difficulties that we have witnessed over the past two years? Yes, uh, the political tension notwithstanding, I think scientific collaboration uh, is already occurring uh, to address this epidemic. Uh, I could tell you that uh, the response from the U.S. side uh, is, is quite substantial. Uh, the federal government, uh, uh, represented by CDC and NIH, have mapped out a strategy. Large players like the Gates Foundation uh, has also uh, mapped out a strategy, and individual scientists uh, like my, myself and many of my colleagues or 
or, or collaborators around the country have all mobilized to contribute whatever they can. Mm. I should say the, the scientific capacity in China is much greater now, and many things are, are well under uh, way in China by the Chinese scientists. But there are certainly in speci specific areas uh, where uh, those of us who are based in America could make a, a selective contribution, and that's what we're trying to do in terms of developing drugs or antibodies that could help uh, treat this infection or block this infection. I see. My last question for you, of course, we also see the rise of xenophobia in some societies against the uh, Chinese in your uh, country, for example, against the Chinese Americans in that case. Uh, what do you make of that? I mean, you've been experiencing Cold Wars. So you saw xenophobia up and down in some societies throughout the decades. Uh, what do you make of the latest? Some say it is another disease, uh, the disease of racial discrimination. As a scientist, how do you see that as, as a minority in your country. How do you see that? Well, I certainly feel that. Uh, at Columbia University, the, the Chinese or Chinese-American students uh, are experiencing that from, from classmates and others are, uh, around them. Uh, Chinatown business is 50 percent down here in New York when there's not a single case of COVID-19 uh, in our area. Uh, and, and of course, as an AIDS investigator, I witnessed xenophobia in a different way uh, when, when people are so scared of, of that virus. But I should say you deal with that by, uh, by education, by clarifying what is true, what is false, and with, with an informed public, xenophobia should go away and to a large extent uh, in America, that is the transition uh, toward HIV, uh, and now uh, I think we, we need to educate much more, and folks uh, in the media like yourself are in a better position to, to address that than we individual scientists, but we certainly will do our part to help clarify. And you are doing it right now. Thank you so much, uh, Professor David Ho. Thank you for taking your time out of your busy schedule of uh, doing research related to the coronavirus outbreak in China. Really appreciate it. David Ho, professor from Columbia Thank University, you. and also he is the one who has been championed the cocktail treatment therapy.